Let's take a trip down memory lane. Imagine you're back at school. You're still in your junior classes. Thanking God for the cool breeze from the ACs in the computer lab during the summer months. You open MS Paint and you start messing around. You start to draw a house. You start with a square for the window. You scroll the mouse wheel to zoom in. And suddenly the square looks double in size. What just happened is an example of linear transformation. For now, say the corners of the square define the square completely. When you perform the zoom in function, the computer took in the vectors of the corner points and transformed them into a scaled version of themselves. A transformation is just a function from one vector space to another. Here, V is called the input space or, or the domain, and W is the output space or the codomain. It is a linear transformation when it satisfies the following. The transformation of the sum of the vectors is equal to the sum of the transformations of the vectors, and the transformation of a scaled vector is the same as the scaled transformation of the vector. Combined together, these two properties say that the transformation of the linear combination of two vectors is equal to the linear combination of the individual transformations. The process of scaling or stretching of a Euclidean space is a linear transformation. The corner point 1 1 is mapped to 2 2, minus 1 1 is mapped to minus 2 2, and so on. So we are essentially mapping vectors from R2 to R2 itself. Let's look at what it takes for defining a linear transformation. First, we must define the input and output spaces. Next, we define a basis for both V and W. And then we define what the transformation does to each input basis vector. Let's look at an example of scaling a 2D space. The transformation takes vectors from R2 and gives back vectors in R2. A nice basis for the input space R2 is the vectors i hat and j hat. And let's use the same basis for the output space as well. Now we need to define what the transformation would do to each basis vector. Let me define it in a way that it takes i hat, that is 1, 0, and maps it to 2, 0. And it maps j hat 0, 1 to 0, 2. Let's look at this transformation graphically. The green vectors are the bases in the input space. And now the red ones are the transformations of these bases vectors. Now you have another vector v in the input space and you want to know where this would land after the transformation. First, we write b in terms of the basis vectors as 1i plus 2j. Now I need to find the transformation of 1i plus 2j. Because of the way we've defined linear transformation, remember those properties, we can write this as 1 times the transformation of i hat plus 2 times the transformation of j hat. We have already defined what happens to i hat and j hat up there, so we just substitute for them and we get the answer to where the vector b must land. Looking at the same thing graphically, b was initially 1i plus 2j. And after the transformation, it's 1 times the transformation of i hat plus 2 times the transformation of j hat. Similarly, every vector in the input space can be written as a linear combination of the bases i hat and j hat. So we can find the transformation of any vector in the input space just by defining what happens to the basis vector. This right here is the reason linear transformations are so common. Now let's see how do we check if a transformation is linear or not. As an example, let me take this transformation in which you input x and y and get cx, cy. You figure out the input and output spaces by looking at the input and output vectors. In this case, it is from R2 to R2. Always do a first quick check where you input the zero vector and you must get the zero vector as the output. Now let's go through property 1. Let me take two arbitrary vectors v1, x1, y1 and v2, x2, y2. Now let's calculate the transformation of v1 plus v2. x1, y1 plus x2, y2 is equal to x1 plus x2, comma y1 plus y2. If you find this a bit fishy, think of this as adding 1, comma 2 and 3, comma 4. You get 4, comma 6. Now we apply the definition of the transformation to this. Again, here we can split it into two sets of coordinates. Just like 4, 6 can be written as 1, 2 plus 3, 4. It's important that you understand this step, so pause the video if you have to and think about it. Now using the definition of the transformation in the reverse order, we can write this as f of x1, y1 plus f of x2, y2 or as f of v1 plus f of v2. And we started with the f of v1 plus v2. So this proves that the first property holds for all vectors in the input space. Now let's check for the second condition. Starting with f of k times v, substituting for v, 
performing scalar vector multiplication, then applying the definition of the transformation, pulling the scalar out, and then reapplying the definition of the transformation, we reach to the conclusion that this property holds as well. The given mapping F is indeed a linear transformation. Linear transformations can also work from n dimensional space to some other m dimensional space where n and m need not be equal. Like when you have a fixed bulb in a room, the shadows of three dimensional objects get mapped to a two dimensional floor. Or it could be from a smaller dimension to a larger dimension as well. As an example, let me take a function from R2 to R3, defined in the following way. What this function essentially does is that it takes a point from a 2D space and associates it with a point in the 3D space. Now let's check if this function is a linear transformation or not. This time, let me use the combined definition. Let me rewrite the function here again. First, the quick check if the origin is mapped to the origin. It's a simple calculation, but one that you must always do. Now to the main part. We substitute for v1 and v2, and then add the x components and the y components. Then we apply the definition of the function and get this big messy thing. Next, we try to clump together things with the same subscript. And now I want to break the single coordinate into two with a plus sign in between. Then we pull out the scalar a and b from each of these. And finally, reapplying the definition, we get to the required result. Since it works out, we say that f is indeed a linear transformation. You can check for the two properties separately as well, but sometimes this is faster. And this is a question from the DSC 2030 exam. The previous example told us that the transformation to vectors from R2 and took them to vectors in R3. Now if I were to do that for every vector in R2, I would get a subset of R3 over here. This subset of R3 here, where all the vectors in the input space are mapped to, is called the image of the transformation. The image is a subset of the codomain. Sometimes it is the entire codomain, sometimes it is not. Take this example here. Every vector in the 2D space is mapped to some vector in the 3D space, like 1 1 is mapped to 1 1 0. All vectors get mapped to the xy plane only. So even though the codomain is R3, the image of f is not the entirety of the codomain. From your calculus days, remember when a function is called surjective or onto? If I were to choose any point in the codomain, I can always find at least one point in the domain to which it is an image of. So everything in the codomain is an image of something in the domain. Our example here is not surjective though, since we have a lot of vectors in the codomain that are not an image of any vector in the domain. Now let's talk about injective or 1 1 functions. If I was looking at some point in B in the codomain and found that two different points in the domain led to this point B, this would not be an injective function. A transformation is called injective when each vector in the output space is at max the image of one vector from the input space. Our example here is in fact injective. If a transformation is both surjective and injective, it is called a bijective transformation. The function that I've taken here projects every point in the 2D space on the x-axis. Graphically, what this means is that a point x, y is transformed to just x, 0. The interesting thing here is that any point 0, y is transformed to 0, 0. So every vector on the y-axis goes to the origin. And so we say that the kernel of f is the line x, x is equal to 0. Kernel is just the set of vectors in the input space that are mapped to the origin in the output space. Now let me ask you a tricky question. Is a transformation always reversible? If I scale vectors to be twice their original length, surely there exists some another transformation that will undo it. So this transformation is irreversible. Similarly, the transformation that rotates all vectors in 2D by some angle theta can be reversed by rotating again by an angle negative theta. So a transformation T from V to W is invertible if there exists another transformation S from W to V such that these two equations hold. Now all this is saying is if you take a vector V, transform it to TV, then transform it again using S, you must get back to the original vector. The second equation works the same. For a given transformation T, if you can find a transformation S that does satisfy these two equations for all the vectors in V and W, only then we say that T is invertible. 
And let me ask when is the transformation not inverted? Well, if it is not 1 1 or injective. An example would be a projection transformation like f of xy is equal to x0. Going from v to w seems easy, but coming back, we don't know which way to go. Secondly, if it is not surjective, remember our example earlier of mapping everything in the 2D space onto the xy plane in the 3D space. When running the reverse transformation, we have points in the codomain which don't know where to go. And third, if it goes from an n dimensional space to an m dimensional space, that is, the domain and the codomain don't have the same dimension. The examples above are valid for this case as well. In short, a transformation is invertible if it goes from an n dimensional to n dimensional space and it is bijective as well. In the next video, we'll make the connection between vectors and matrices and we will use matrices to answer questions like if a transformation is linear or not, what is the image of a transformation and so on and so forth. So see you in the next video.